Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Zach coming to you from Washington, D.C. And today we will be discussing distracting lighting, university politics, noise in a small theater, being stuck in the past, and shiny awards, all on Light Talk. And this is Brackley coming to you from Las Vegas, Nevada. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. Yes, we are. And welcome, everyone, to episode 318. So have you guys heard anything from David? Is he just lost in Canada somewhere doing opera? I haven't heard a word. Yeah, I've seen some pictures. He has a handsome cap that he's wearing. <laughs> and I saw that. So he'll, he'll be back with us, I guess, in a week or so. So he's up there just lighting the hell out of Tosca. You know, I have some industry news today. The Writers Guild, um, you know, about the strike, I'm sure. Uh, and it's interesting, one of the things they're arguing. So they're demanding a whole bunch of changes from the Alliance of Motion Pictures and Television Producers, from an increase in pay to receiving clear guidelines around working with streaming services. But as part of their demands, the WGA is also fighting to protect their livelihoods from AI. Mm. In a proposal published on WGA's website this week, the labor union said AI should be regulated so it can't write or rewrite material, can't be used as source material, and that the writer's work can't be used to train AI to replace them. What do you think of that? A little late for that, isn't it? (laughs) The train's going out of the station already, I think. AI yeah. is coming for all of us, man. It is coming for totally. all of us. Well we, well, we use the AI visuals for some of our research. Our, some of our lighting designers are doing that, which is great. But the whole yeah. writing thing is kind of scary. Yeah, I'm, I'll tell you, my brother-in-law is an author, and I went into chat GPT, and I said, I asked it to tell me a, gar, a story about Garfield the cat. <laughs> in the style of him as the author and it churned one out in about 10 seconds that sound like it could have been written by him <laughs> hmm. and then i tried it in the style of ernest hemingway and then in the style of a fourth grader and every time it you know the fourth grader one was fascinating because it it included spelling errors in it so i think that you know as you said it's already there <laughs> so we just have to you know, the one thing that's interesting about it is you can reverse engineer it too. You can feed it a story or a document and ask it if it was generated by AI or if it was written by a person, and it can usually tell. So how are they going to regulate it? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, it seems like it's going to be banned. Right. That may but be the part not... that they concede on. <laughs> that would probably be an easy part. To, to kick kick that can down the road for a while. Right. Well, you know, when you design a show, you usually, we always design one thing that can be the thing that gets cut. So we get all the stuff we want. <laughs> is, right. that what, is that how you do it? Yeah. I'll have to remember that. I mean, the interesting part too there is the streaming royalties, because I think that that also has an impact on our industry with all the cinecasting and things like that Broadway HD channel that's available for streaming where uh, I, at least in the past when I've worked on projects that ended up on one of those services, we usually got some kind of buyout. We didn't get a royalty. So, you know, they might give us a certain amount of money and then they might make a ton more off of broadcasting whatever they've filmed. And I think that that's still one of those challenges that we're dealing with Whenever we, whenever our union ha- goes in for a collective bargaining agreement, you know, they're all, the cinecasting is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. And did you think your buyout was fair? I mean, I, I thought it was fair, but it was also in like 2012 or 13. So now I'm not so sure. <laughs> I know I, I did um, back during the, the COVID days. Um, I did a play that was, uh, shot so that it could be streamed. And I was surprised that at the end of that run, um, the company had sold 20,000 tickets around the country. Wow. And you got how much from that? I didn't. I, I, well, I don't think I got 
<laughs> no one expected that kind of revenue to come in. So I, I can't imagine if it's something super high quality, the, the amount of money that's coming in on that project. So it, it is a, a sticky wicket there to figure out what your percentages are yeah. if they're just giving you a buyout as opposed to a royalty. It's true. And I think that for some of those services, reporting, uh, you know, reporting how many people have streamed is not normally part of the, what they provide. So they're not expecting uh, us like in the same way where as in theater with royalties, you know, that they're required to tell us what the gross was so we can figure out how much we're going to get and all that other stuff. I think that these streamers prefer to just, you know, One hand you a pile of cash and tell you to go away. Yep. You know, I guess it's time to give a shout out to everybody who's about to graduate. We have all of these students who are getting their bachelor's or their MFA and they're about to hit the job market here in a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. Have you guys got your uh, reservations made for LDI this year? It's just a few short months away. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna be, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a crazy time because the week before is when the Formula One is here in Vegas, and it's just oh, gonna wow. be very crowded. That's why she moved it because the hotel rates during Formula One are like four times what they normally are, at least. I'm glad it moved because it's not going to interfere with any productions that I'm watching. Right. Oh, I need to kind of be in Dallas when my students are mounting a show. So for me, at least, this was a really good time. This, yeah. uh, and the like, Formula One has been signed for 10 years, so this might be the same, the same um, time every year. Yeah, and it was also, this, you know, for the last few years, the same week as the IAPA uh, trade show, which is in Orlando, which I think is part of the reason that they've not been in Orlando anymore. Uh, and that trade show is really more geared towards theme parks and stuff like that. But there's a tremendous amount of crossover in the people that attend. And mm -hmm. I know last year, some people were going back and forth and that I thought that was just exhausting. It sounded to me <laughs> to mm. do both in the same week. Um, but this year, one of the things that I'm happy about since there is no crossover is I'm going to be, uh, in charge of all the things that involve projections and media at LDI. So will you be possibly able to be on the LDI portfolio review this year? Or is that probably not? Uh, well, since it's still in its infancy in terms of what the schedule will be, I can certainly try to keep that open. Yep. Are you guys going to have interns this year and, uh, that type of thing? Uh, I mean, they always want to. Okay. <laughs> I think, there. you know, again, I think we might have talked about this before of how LDI is now uh, sort of co-hosting with the Digital Signage Expo at the same time. Right. And they're sort of merging. So I think that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the Yiddish word Hamisha, you know, it's like having like a family like <laughs> feeling, it, you know, the family has grown quite a bit. And I think that uh, while interns are still something we all want that uh, I don't even know who's in charge anymore. <laughs> it's true. OK, well, you know, we, we will keep doing postings and let people know if there's opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. Well, Zach, heck, let's get started. I think you have the first question. I do. So Sarah in Burbank writes, I'm working in a 99 seat theater and I'm concerned about projector noise. Any tips or tricks to minimize it? Well, Sarah, this is the bane of my existence, this question. Um, the one thing I can tell you is if you have the opportunity to use a laser projector as opposed to a traditional projector powered by a lamp, that is going to cut your sound by at least 50 or 60% right away. Uh, the, you know, the fan noise on a laser projector that doesn't require as much fan action. So uh, you end up having a lot less noise right away. Um, there's all kinds of things that I've seen. Uh, one of the most successful things that I ever saw was on a production I did uh, where they built a box around the projector that had little tiny fans in it that blew on the projector. So the little fans made a lot less noise than the big fan in the projector. And enough of them in this box kept the projector cool enough that the big fan didn't have to kick in. 
Um, I mean, if your 99 seat theater has a booth and you can put the projector in the booth, that's certainly helpful too. Although your stage manager may complain about the noise. Uh, so sometimes it's just a game of who's going to care about the noise the least and keep the projector away from the person that cares about it the most. You know, but, what, what you could do is uh, if you're worried about the fan noise of that projector, you know, moving lights now have a, uh, uh, I guess, a, a concert mode, which the fan is running full out, um, a studio mode and a whisper mode. And so the clever lighting designer now runs his or her moving lights in whisper mode. What you could do is sit near the director and say, you know, those moving lights are awfully dim, aren't they? You know, force that line designer to crank up to concert mode, and then the the moving lights will be so loud, the projector will be the last thing they're thinking about. Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I was thinking if you have a lot of moving lights in there, the old moving lights, you won't have to worry about the projector noise at all. Do, pro- right. do projectors not have things like studio and whisper mode on them? I mean, I know it cuts uh, output. Not really. Hmm. Um, it, it's interesting. I, they're, the only projector that I recall that had a switching of modes in general was the, uh, um, I think it was the DL3, the, that was like the moving light projector. And right. it had two modes, fast and accurate. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it sense. needs a third. You can have two, but not all three. Right. <laughs> Fast, uh, accurate, yeah, and so quiet. I'm sure you guys deal with that. I mean, it's funny, like Brackley, you mentioned the moving lights that I do remember a situation where everyone thought the projector was loud. And then I said, let's leave the lights on and not turn them off first. And you can hear what's, <laughs> and they're like, the projector's so loud. I said, the projector's off. <laughs> right, right. Well, the other thing is what I tell some people is that if you turn all the equipment on, it becomes the white noise. So the, the audience yes. becomes used to that. Depends on how loud it is. But then then you don't want to turn it off because then that sudden silence, all of a sudden people go, what's that? What's yeah. that? Yeah, I had an experience like that too on one show where the director was like, there's no projections in act two. So uh, where can we turn it off after the last song that has projections in it in act one? And I said, you'll hear it turning off. And that will be more annoying than <laughs> right. the fan noise. The lack of sound sometimes is as yeah. annoying as more sound. Well, and a lot of projectors, especially ones that have a lamp, the fan revs up to like high speed to cool it off as it's turning off as part of the shutdown. So you definitely don't want that happening in the middle of your production. of. A number of years ago, we had those old something. Pony projectors. Which oh, yes. They, they made a lot of noise. So we ended up putting those in the booth. Otherwise, there's no way people yes. would have been able to live with that. But they did an right. opera those projectors, all the time. Yeah, they can project on a pyramid, right, you know, exactly. in Egypt. <laughs> so this, there, you got to give up something if you want to make an image that big and bright. Yes, yes. Do you, st- do you still use them, Brackley? No, still no, got them? they've been retired. Nobody wants them. We, we got these, uh, we got 20 of them donated from Siegfried and Roy when they, when they went out of business. And so we've, uh, we ended up, we sold one to Stan in Florida, but nobody else wanted them because that's when these other, these other, you know, the other projectors came about and Pawnees were really put out in the past. I know Wendell Harrington had an opera that was going around that had Pawnee projectors. And I think in the last few years, she converted it to digital. Yes. There was nobody to service them. Exactly. No, it was, we had one of our former students who was running the projectors at Siegfried and Roy would come over and help us, you know, because yeah. they're time consuming to really, to really um, deal with. But we yeah. had Thomas Munn, the late Thomas Munn opera designer. He worked with us at UC Davis and he helped us uh, refurbish them. And they were all, we had about four or five working really well. So I had wow. dollar signs in my eyes, but nobody, nobody <laughs> bought. Right. They can be in the museum and say, on loan from the permanent collection. <laughs> exactly. Of. But they were great machines. I mean, boy, the images yeah. were great. Yes. I would certainly agree. Okay. The next question comes from Rhonda in Oregon asks, when watching a colleague show and their lighting is distracting, what strategies do you use to say something positive? Well, it depends on what you mean by distracting. I didn't quite understand that. Do you mean it's too dark? You mean there are, it looks like flash and trash? Um, I just don't exactly know. But um, I always rather say something positive first before I say, or I'll ask somebody, so what do you think? 
how do you think? And sometimes they'll say, oh, well, I had to do X, Y, and Z, and it was too dark, and blah, blah, blah. And the director, usually the director wanted this, and we had it that. So it's all, it's, it's kind of a tap dance sometimes, but, you know, you don't want to hurt feelings, especially if they're friends of yours. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, if you're going to see a production of Waiting for Godot and it's all flash and trash lighting, you know, that would be distracting to me. Um, <laughs> right. But like, you know, I think we all have our, our bag of tricks that we can pull out of, you know, you say, oh, you must be so happy that you finally have an audience now, you know, things like that. <laughs> you can really talk about the production without even talking about the lighting. Right. Uh, and, and keep it positive in that way. Right. Um, the, the real challenge for me I, I, is if they go, well, what did you think about the lighting and, and like, what would you change? And then, um, you know, I, I would freeze. Let's go and, get a drink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'd be like, well, you know, what did you think? Yeah. I think it's right. You, you reflect it back to them like a good psychiatrist. Right. That's what I always do. <laughs> yeah. What do you do, Steve? Well, you know, you could turn that question a little bit and, and, and say, you know, what, what do you tell your. Uh, students, when their lighting is a little distracting, right? You know, you know. For me, what I do is generally there's something positive to be said about their lighting. So you, you know, there's generally something very positive to be said. And generally, where they get in trouble, or maybe your colleague gets in trouble, is that he or she um, had an idea, and you see that idea developing, and about halfway through the show, they abandon that idea. It's like mm. it's like. I've seen, I don't know, 45 minutes of a white light show, and all of a sudden, here comes massive amounts of color into it for no, yeah. no good reason. And you kind of say, well, you know, that's, you had a really interesting idea here. Why, why did you abandon that idea? And that sometimes encourages them to, uh, uh, to look at their work again and go, you know, the white light wasn't bad. You know, I don't have to chicken out and all of a sudden turn on a bunch of gobos and blue and red light and you know, you help them stay on the path that they have started. Yes, but but I think true. it's difficult just to walk up, you know, so if I walk up to Brackley and go, gee, yeah, that sucked. <laughs> you, know, hey, thanks, Steve. Right. you know, I'm even hesitant uh, when someone says, what do you think? Well, uh, the, well the, uh, the other thing is if you're good friends with someone, I mean, you're really, really good friends and they trust you, you can be a little bit more honest and a little bit more forthcoming, I think, than if you just, you know, they're an acquaintance. Well, I, yeah. I had a friend, um, I think he was, I think he was Jules Fisher's associate for a while. Mm. And this has been a while. So it's good, good 20 years ago. And he said he would always get in trouble because uh, Jules would sit him to the balcony and say, what's it look like from up there? And invariably he would say, I, you might want to come up here and look for yourself. <laughs> 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 rather than say well <laughs> now that i can really see the floor <laughs> we got some problems so hey, true. You, you know i remember once my sister said something that is probably ac applicable to us our our people as a group which was when she goes to a show that she hasn't paid for she would say you know i can't really be critical of this because i didn't pay for the tickets <laughs> Right, yeah, right. You know, but if you did pay for it, you want to make sure you got your money's worth. That's true. <laughs> okay, well, I have the next question. It is Russell in North Carolina, and he writes, How do you balance university politics with your educational mission? Well, there's, there's a couple ways to answer that question. Uh, when you say university politics, I'm thinking about the entire campus. So I'm assuming you don't mean departmental politics. So I'm going to approach it from a university <laughs> point of view. Uh, you know, there are politics everywhere. And politics isn't necessarily bad. Um, politics might be how you are interacting uh, with your dean or with your provost uh, when you're trying to explain the um, foundation of what your undergraduate or graduate program is. You're having to bring these people along who, who are concerned about half a dozen different programs. If it's a liberal arts, some theaters are part of liberal arts programs. So that dean may have five or six programs inside um, his or her um, watchtower to manage and operate and make sure they're funded and, 
and they're getting the resources they need. Politics, I think, um, is about being prepared. So I'm, I'm kind of ignoring the, uh, the kind of politics that sometimes we think of as bad, you know, backbiting, um, saying rude things about people, fighting over the most ridiculous things in the world. Politics is about education and making sure the people who can help you are educated um, rather than you just being off in a corner sulking because you don't think you're getting a fair shake from uh, someone in the administration. Brackley, I mean, you're at a university. What, what we, is there a we, difference? We have no politics here, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> is there a <laughs> right. difference between university politics and departmental politics? Yes, 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 there are. But uh, basically, your educational mission is teaching the students. The students should always come first, and any good educational institution should realize that. So what you're, when you're dealing with your university politics, you're right. You need to educate the deans and the provosts and the presidents as to what you're doing because they're more into the STEM, not the STEAM. So um, I think that's really important to really educate them as to what you're doing and to show them why you're doing it and how it's important for you. Yeah, you're going to have petty stuff happening all the time. But um, I was chair for a year, so I know that. But it's, um, it's really trying to get the students the best work that you can. So do you guys feel like there's a difference uh, between a private university and a state school in terms of politics? Well, you're at, a, you're at a private school there, Steve. Well, I've taught at a public school, and, I've, and I'm teaching now at a private school. The, what I think, and I'm not an expert, but what I, what I think is in a private school, change can come faster than in a public school. It, it seems like what takes me a year to do at SMU might have taken me three or four years to do when I was in Baton Rouge teaching at LSU. I, I have to agree. I have to agree because I've taught, I've taught at both schools. Both, I bought private Dartmouth and then a couple of, um, of uh, public schools. And you're right. The, you have to go through more hoops, it seems, in the, in the state school system than you do in the private school. Sometimes if you want to pay for something, they just write you a check and it's easy. And sometimes in the, in the um, – uh, other schools, you have to go through all these forms, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's more red tape in, in state schools. Interesting. And that's a good question. Yeah. You are listening to Light Talk with the Lumen Brothers, and Light Talk is sponsored by... Well, the summer stock theater season is about to start. That means hot summer days, climbing light towers, and swatting mosquitoes. It also means looking for shade putting off today what you can do tomorrow, and drinking a few cold ones. It also means your tool belt is not complete without the Cytospell Focus Tool. The name says it all, Cytospell, the preferred focus tool of stage hands throughout Dixie. I own three, one for school, one for home, and one for the car. The Cytospell Focus Tool's main feature is as a bottle opener, because you never know when you're going to need a frosty brew. The Cytospell Focus Tool will open craft, domestic, and all those uppity European beers with ease. Not only that, but it also works with classic pull tab brews like Natural Ice Light, Michelob Ultra, and Milwaukee's Best. Why? Because you're a stagehand, my friend, and you can't afford the good stuff. The Cytospell Focus Tool is unique in that its fixed position jaws fit all the nuts and bolts on every major lighting fixture, foreign and domestic, both imperial and metric. Just not very well. But that keeps the manufacturing costs low. So after an hour of slow, frustrating work, you're going to be ready for an icy brew. Did I mention it's also a bottle opener? The Cytospell Focus Tool, perfect for summer stock, rodeos, and state fairs. So when all those Yankee stagehands can't open that bottle of Shiner, just say, well, bless your heart, and hand over a Cytospell Focus Tool. The Cytospell Focus Tool is not compatible with wine spritzers, Asian beers, or champagne. But who really cares? The Cytospell Focus Tool, <laughs> order one now for Mother's Day. <laughs> That's great. I want one and of those. Now, back to light talk. 
Well, the sound of those tuxedo-wearing, award-starved, lovable New York City monkeys bouncing around my living room means it's time for Let's Talk About. And today's Let's Talk About, the Tony Awards. What do you guys think? Just announced the other day, the nominations. Yeah, just announced. I think it it's a really uh, nice thing to see that it's a combination of the old guard, the veterans, and a lot of uh, newcomers or younger people. In fact, I I had a moment where I realized that I'm getting older uh, <laughs> right. when I, you know, I realized that a lot of my congratulatory messages have gone from I'm uh, so happy for you to I'm so proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, for instance, like Jen Schriever, who was uh, nominated for Death of a Salesman. Um, I've known her since about 2008 when she was Brian McDevitt's assistant on a catered affair and it's just been really wonderful to see her career blossom and how awesome she you know i knew she was awesome way back then but now everybody knows so it's been really great to see people like ben stanton whom i've also known for a really long time and of course it's always fun to see when someone like natasha katz is nominated for two Two awards yes awards in the same category the downside of that though is she may take herself out I, you know, that's always one of the metrics that people say. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> too many. I'm happy for Jen, yeah. too. Uh, Jen was in our, at the LDI Portfolio Review this year uh, for the first time I first met her. And she's what, a wonderful woman. And uh, I asked her uh, right after that, she wants to do it again. But it's so happy for her that she was nominated. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's a good group. Well, who got snubbed this year? I, I think I really can't say. <laughs> There are some there are some on there also that I will say I'm a little surprised about as well. But, um, you know, I think that uh, it what, what I found interesting in in another category was that uh, for for the for the best actress in a leading role, there's only four people. And I, I was like every other category has like five to seven people except that one. But I. I I can't imagine that there were not other performances not worthy. They could have just stuck a few other ones in there. So that was surprising to me. And I know there was some controversy about New York, New York, uh, because it was pre-existing music from the movie that they decided that even though there were a few new songs and new lyrics by Lin-Manuel Miranda, that it was not eligible as a musical or for a new musical which I, you know, it's always interesting uh, when they taught when there are revivals that have been altered enough that they're now considered new. Right. <clears throat> you mean there poli- there's politics in the Tonys? There is. <laughs> right. what, what show has got has got the most nominations? Is it Some Like It Hot? Am I, I think so. Am I right about that? Oh, and to answer my own question, correct. you know, who got snubbed this year was Bad Cinderella. You know, 35, <laughs> 35 years of Andrew Lloyd Webber on Broadway, and now he's back with Bad Cinderella. Uh, I mean, the times, the post, and variety were not kind. But, yeah. uh, you know, there, I, think not, I think he got no, no nominations. It didn't. But I think he's a little critic-proof, so he'll be okay. Well, yeah, I bet. He'll still live. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I mean, I got, I got, it, it seemed to have gotten very good reviews in London. So it's a little surprising. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think in London, it wasn't bad Cinderella. It was just Cinderella. <laughs> Can you imagine changing your name to bad Cinderella? And, and then you look at the reviews that came from the Times, the Post, and the Variety. I mean, that was... Yes. I remember years ago, I saw a review on Titanic. And it said, um, the Titanic wasn't the only thing that sank last night. Yes, so, yes. You got to be careful <laughs> about what you name your show. <laughs> Yes, I remember one of the the very first shows I ever worked on was a play called Surviving Grace. And of course, that was perfect. It was ready for reviews of There's No Surviving Grace. (laughs) There's No Surviving Grace. (laughs) Yes. So I totally understand. I mean, the other thing, I, I worked on a musical called In My Life, and they actually managed to manipulate a bad review to pull quotes from it and use that in their ads. So one of the things was, I think in the New York Times review, 
It said it had jaw-dropping moments of whimsy, but it didn't mean it in a good way, but just they cut that quote out and stuck it on the poster. <laughs> Gotta promote your show. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it'll be very interesting to see who wins. I mean, there's a lot of uh, really interesting stuff, you know, and it's a lot of really different things. So it's not all just like a bunch of classic musicals. There's a lot of variety in what's out there. Yeah, I mean, I've got a sweet spot there for Sweeney Todd. I'm uh, pulling for that. What what's what is the situation now with Tony Awards and projections? Where where has that landed? Uh, well, it's interesting that in the last few years they've sort of co-nominated the projection designer with either a scenic designer or a lighting designer. You know, I don't know the secret algorithm where the Tony committee determines if the projections are more of a lighting thing or more of a scenic thing. I mean, I like to think that they're their own thing, first of all. Um, you know, Wendell Harrington once told me uh, if they're not going to make a category for it and they're going to just have scenic design, then they should turn off the projections on the day that the, you know, the Tony nominators come. <laughs> right. That's right, because I think it was the last year that Derek McLean and Peter Negrini were up for uh, up for one. Yes, yes. So this year there's several, and they're all included in the scenic design category. So Camelot and Life Pi and Christmas Carol all have co-nominations between the scenic designer and the projection designer. That's interesting. Well, it should be its own. It should be its own category. And are you I, are you ready to uh, predict? Which one of those shows will get the Tony? Uh, I, my guess for scenic design is going to go to New York, New York. And for scenic design of a play, I think it's either going to be Life of Pi or Christmas Carol. Those have are my you, have you seen them all, Zach? I've not seen them all, okay. but I've seen some. Okay. That's the trouble. Being way out here, it's like I don't get to New York yeah. all that often. Well, that's why we're not Tony voters. That's right. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Although the, the late John Iacovelli was a Tony Award, the scenic designer. Yes, yes. What, what does it take to be a Tony uh, Award voter? Uh, well, I think one of the things is you actually can't design a show in the season that uh, you're a voter in. Oh, so they so must have a whole you, slew of voters out there that they pick from every year. Right. The so bitter, the I'm, bitter people. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is besides that. Um, I know they published the list of of nominators, but I don't know if they published the list of voters. And the nominators also they have representation from the unions and a bunch of other things because I think they're trying to keep it all on the level. Well, years and years and years and years ago, I was a Grammy voter. Um, and wow! Oh, wow. They, well, this is no no big deal. The album. Um, if, if the album you work on reaches a certain number of sales, then you're invited to, to oh, vote. Cool. So, so what so album what did album you sing you on, on, Steve? What's I don't that? remember hearing your singing album. <laughs> so, so I don't know. I, I, you know, I would be. I mean, what? Who? I've, I think I've known a couple of the uh, Tony uh, voters in the past, and. I've never asked them what it what it actually is required of them, but hmm. just seeing all the shows is a great undertaking. Yes, yes, I, and I think that part of the challenge too is that after the nominations, there are several shows that have been closed for months. So how do you evaluate oh, that's that? Right. Yes. Oh yeah. So, so I don't know how you do that. So it's a, a lot of work. It's a ton yeah. of work. And I'm sure yes. there are examples of some shows that have closed that have won Tonys. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But it's, so it's a lot of work for a broadcast that has very few viewers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Is that continuing to drop? Uh, I don't know if it's continuing to drop, but I know that this year uh, they couldn't get Radio City Music Hall, so they've moved to another theater that's like up in the heights. So Lin-Manuel Miranda is very excited about that. Hmm. I always thought it was kind of rough that you would see um, a photograph of a designer standing in a hallway somewhere uh, 
thanking the committee for their award, giving them a whole yeah. like eight seconds to say thank you before they cut back to a musical number. And yes. I, I realize, you know, a lot of people don't want to see that, but you know, it's an award show. Take take it, you know, take it all or leave it all well, aside. I remember a number of years ago, PBS used to do the hour before the Tonys, and yes. they used to do yes. a whole nice. In fact, I recorded it for my students. A whole nice uh, uh, representation of all the design, all the nominated designers, what their shows were, and they talked about their shows. I thought oh, that, that was nice. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when David Gallo won the Tony Award for Drowsy Chaperone. Uh, as we've learned on this show when we interviewed him that I've known him since we were kids and he was my babysitter <laughs> right, right. that uh, he thanked my dad and he told my dad, like, I thanked you in my speech. And it took like two weeks before my dad could find it on the internet. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. But that's the way it goes. Well, Steve has our last question for the day. And it is Roger in Pennsylvania. And Roger writes, are university theater programs stuck in the past? How can Ooh. you even ask that question, Roger? You must be looking at their enrollment, and uh, everybody looks exactly the same. Or their season selection, with, and there's not a play done that's by a playwright who is uh, under Still 30 alive. and not dead. Yes, right. season selection. Man, inward-looking summer stock seasons so that their students don't have to go anywhere else to, uh, to work. You know, are you talking about production and design being treated as a service organization? <laughs> or, or, may, or maybe uh, uh, universities that are unable to keep up with technology and design or deciding after 50 years they're going to teach something risky like acting for the camera? Uh, or when you say, you say, we want to add projection or media into the show and the director says, I don't think slides are appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I, I think theater programs do get stuck in the past. Yes. And I think they get stuck in the past, uh, because that's comfortable. They found something that works. They, they found a way to provide an education, uh, that works. And so they're hesitant to try anything different because they don't have a lot of time to fix it if they mess it up. But, you know, I, I was thinking today, I'm going to heresy here. I'm, I'm not sure why we have a theater history class anymore. I know there are PhDs out there grabbing their chest right now, but do I really need another, you know, discussion on uh, medieval, uh, I don't know, religious drama? Uh, it's weird. You know, if you, if you think about... Uh, the changes that don't happen. If you look at acting programs, you know, movement and voice, has that really changed that much? There is a, a way of teaching that, a, a system. So you fall into that pattern. Um, design changes a little bit, but not terribly much because often the technology that's required to advance the design program is out of the uh, reach of so many schools across the country. They just don't have the money to invest in a state-of-the-art console or a visualization program, um, it, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. It'll be interesting to see what happens as universities uh, more and more start moving to professors of practice. You know, the universities are kind of phasing out, it feels like they're phasing out tenured lines, replacing that with professors of practice and I guess the idea is that you have someone who is uh, young and starting their career um, who is going to be at your school for three, maybe five years max, and then you're going to replace them and then replace them, then replace them. So you always have a fresh, innovative approach in the classroom, people bringing current ideas into the classroom. So I'm anxious to see how that plays out. I think you're right in, in a lot of what you said, but I also think some university programs are um – looking into more live entertainment and they're, they're, they're really branching out onto these other forms of, of, uh, yeah, live entertainment and not just doing waiting for Godot and, and, and Shakespeare because there has to be a balance there. But I know, I know some programs like ours, I, I want my students more, um, well-rounded and they take cinematography, they do architectural design. So I think it depends on the university. I guess some are, as you say, quote, stuck in the past, but I think others are really realizing that there is more to uh, 
or at least in the design realm, there's more to things than just uh, doing um, uh, straight plays or even musicals. So I think there's a balance there. Um, but I also think that there are programs that are being a little bit more innovative. Oh, I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree. You know, the, the schools that can are expanding, as you suggest, into whatever entertainment design is. I think schools are trying to figure out what uh, media or projection is. I think schools are we're trying to figure it out. And some schools are going to be successful and some schools, you know, are just not going to have the resources to, to compete. Well, and also you say the professor of practice, so we need to probably define that to people who don't know what it is. It's, it's really bringing in professors with, that aren't tenure track or don't have the possibility of getting tenure. So they can be at a, at a university for five years and then they can say, okay, I'm going to go somewhere else. So that is, I think, bringing younger people in, not necessarily the professor of practices, but bringing younger, the younger generation and, and the, the media designers in is so important because some of these some of these university theater programs have people like my age <laughs> who have been there for a long time uh but um and who are maybe stuck in the past but i think the younger generation and if we breed these younger students that that theater is more than just um waiting for godot i keep so, sorry i keep mentioning that but uh, i think that's where that's where it's at to get the energy going and get the energy of new exciting there's a lot of excitement out there I mean, a lot of also immersive theater that's totally different than than um, uh, standard theater, which I think I know some of our students are very much involved with. We have this Meow Wolf at the Area 15 here in Vegas that some of our students mm-hmm. are working at that are just really, really exciting stuff. Talk about projections. Oh, my Lord. There are just tons yeah, of yeah. projections. And it's really exciting to see where we're going in that aspect. And the whole, you know, the Electric Daisy Carnival stuff that's happening. I mean, yes. the t- concert, there, there's so much more than just doing the school play. Well, I'm sure you can list a, a fairly detailed list of people in Las Vegas that you would like to bring in as a professor of practice for a couple of years. Yeah. Even if well, I like Benny, Benny Kirkham was a phenomenal mm. uh, programmer. He, yeah. uh, I've always wanted him to come. Tr- trouble is like these people are working all over the world, but during the pandemic, he wasn't doing anything. So he came and he taught a whole class with us on show control in the grand ma and oh, we're awesome. just so fortunate to have him for that semester absolutely but getting people in i mean people like have a job <laughs> and they're working right but right. with zoom it's great uh the, i hated teaching on zoom but zoom is great because i've been bringing in uh, either designers or programmers to you know at least talk to the students having been a professor of practice before i would say that it, it's a really good thing because you get not only do you have access to somebody who's working currently, but that person also has access to their own peers to possibly bring in as well. Um, and you don't have to worry about committees. <laughs> right. But one of the challenges that I encountered, which I think kind of harkens back to the question about politics, is that some of the reason that the theater program was stuck in the past is that they're, the people who were above the people in the theater program are making some decisions that about things that they don't really know anything about. And so, you know, the politics sometimes can prevent growth from happening. Uh, But one of the things I always tried to do was, you know, like the Montessori method of meeting the students where they're at. Like, you tell me what you want to learn, you know, and that's a good way to keep it current as well, is to, you know, find out what these kids want to learn, because they probably don't want to do Waiting for Godot. Or if they do want to do Waiting for Godot, they want to like do it in a pool naked or something weird like that, you know, which would be more modern interpretation of it. <laughs> so you can go to, that's the Cal Arts method. The Cal Arts <laughs> method. Yeah, that, I think that, yeah. you know, I think you're right. But a lot of the people who, as you say, who run the programs don't see it that way. Yeah. You know, it's funny you bring up Waiting for Godot because that's, that's probably our, I'm going to say that's our worst example uh, because you have the estate. Uh, mm-hmm. I worked with a, a director and a designer who had decided they were going to stage Waiting for Godot backstage of the Teletubbies. And, I mean, <laughs> it was really clever and beautiful and exciting, and the estate went, no, no. <laughs> we're not going to do it backstage at the uh, at the Teletubbies. That's funny. Uh, that's true. The uh, American Repertory Theater wanted to do a production of Endgame, Beckett, uh, and they set it in a bombed uh, Boston subway in the States that, no, nope, can't do it. But they So they went to court, 
and they went back and forth and they ended up doing the show, but they had a big thing in the program, big message in the program that Beckett, you know, Samuel Beckett does not agree with this production or something. Mm. Yeah, I think I think you need to go for that all nude sound of music in a swimming pool. That would probably work. There you go. Well, the rocking sound of the Luminoids tell us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate, the Snoot Group with a legal team of Sparks, Burnout, and Chase will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Sin City, Foggy Bottom, and the Lone Star State. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more lighting shenanigans and serve you more of our casserole of nonsense. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. We will see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you later.